Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Chimamanda, our conversation today has been titled Humanizing History and Connecting Cultures, inspired by comments you've made about the role of literature and the importance of challenging that notion of a single story. I want to ask, first of all, do you think that fiction in particular allows for the telling of a truth that's deeper than mere fact? I do think so, but um, I'm, and, I, and I'm particularly drawn as a reader and writer to... to you know, the kind of fiction that's based on fact, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. In writing fiction, I just feel very free. I, there's a sense in which I, I sort of feel that I can be, um, I can be radically honest. Mm -hmm. and, and, by, and by that, it means that there's a greater depth and that it can illuminate facts. So are you saying that, you know, taking those historical facts and weaving stories about them, what is it then that sort of allows it to become something that's just not merely a story because, mm. you know, in the end one feels a deep connection? How does, how does that alchemy work? I really don't know. I think maybe it's, 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 it's what I like to sometimes call emotional truth and also maybe heart. Mm -hmm. um, when I was researching Half of the Yellow Sun, I tried to read everything that, had that, you know, all the books published about that period and I talked to lots and lots of people. And initially, I put everything in the book because I thought, you know, I spent so much time in archives and libraries, people have to know that I did all this work. <laughs> so the first draft was huge, and I threw in everything. The French government rule, the Israel, everything was in there. But I think at some point, the revising process was about me saying to myself, in the end, it's about human beings. I want people to read this book and come away, hopefully, thinking about what it means to be human in a situation of this sort. If you're reduced from, you know, making sandwiches for your kids to having your child asked to eat a lizard, mm. what does it do to you, you know? Uh, so it was just sort of always telling myself it's about the human being. I want this to be a very human book. I want emotion to be at the heart of it because that's what I go to fiction for. Mm. I want to be moved by fiction, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, but, but how does it work? I, 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 I don't know the formula. I, <laughs> I sort of go with hope um, that it will work. I've, I've long wanted to ask you about this realist fiction because I, I worry that you then exclude um, genre. But I was delighted to read in an interview that you wanted in Americana to write a love story. And, and I, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure you mentioned Mills and Boone or Barbara Cartland, one of those respected <laughs> <laughs> and, and that made me really happy. So I wanted to ask you if, if you think that the genre cannot cannot do it in the same way. I'm not even very interested in this sort of debate about genre as good and something else called literary fiction, mm -hmm. as, as genre as sort of not good and literary fiction. For me, it's really something can be well written or not. And I do think that there are a number of books that we consider serious fiction that are fundamentally love stories. Mm. You know, love matters, um, mm. love stories matter. And I'm just, yeah, so I, I very much wanted to write a love story and, and you know, in a way that's very unapologetic. It's a love story and I'm, and, and uh, yeah. You, for several years now, you've been running writing workshops in Nigeria and um, thinking about this idea of, you know, telling a story, telling our stories. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the writers you've encountered and what they're wanting to write. Last year, we had 2,000 people apply for 20 spots, which, you know, and, and maybe 15% uh, of that was just really rubbish, you know, people who just imagine that they're writers. But the rest of it were people who deeply care about storytelling, read books, are interested in, in bettering their writing. And, you know, I want to have class diversity. So you sort of can tell from the writing um, often, but sometimes from their dress, where, what people, where they are, where they've gone to school, what, you know. And it's very important for me to have that, to have that sort of diversity. And then I want men and women, and I want North and South and East and West. So I, I really sort of very carefully look at the... And what happens in the end, I think, is that we have a class of 20 people who, who represent Nigeria, and increasingly Africa, because, you know, we had, um, we've had Ghana, Malawi, Kenya. Um, and, but it's that people then come there, and at the end of the workshop, they're doing such 
it's, they're different. Mm -hmm. They're different. The way that they write has changed. And then uh, people who, there are people who are very much interested increasingly, I think, in writing about the sorts of things that we don't usually talk about. And I encourage that in the workshop. Mm -hmm. So now we have stories about gay Nigerians. Right? Um, we have stories about, um, we have stories that complicate this whole idea of corruption. Because I think traditionally the idea is that the corrupt politician is a bad man. Right. But now I see people writing about corruption in more complicated ways because that you are a public servant who is corrupt doesn't actually mean that you're a bad man. That's interesting. You know, um, so I see people dealing with those things more. Um, and I think because, because under the military, we really cultural production went down so much in Nigeria. And at some point, I think maybe we started to think that we're not producing culturally. Mm. But we were, it was just a question of opportunity. And now I'm just realizing so many people want to write. So many people want to tell stories. So many people are interested in, and yeah, it's really, really quite diverse what people are producing. It's you know? exciting and, and it strikes me as, as really important work, thinking about sort of, you've, you've spoken quite eloquently about the stories you wrote as a, as a child, you know, stories that are based on um, the British and American children's books that you were reading. and. You spoke of how the, the work of Chenua Achebe gave you permission to write your own books. And it strikes me that the, the writers you're now encountering um, are perhaps living in a world where those, those stories, that, that that permission is all out there. Do you, do you think that they feel it in a way that perhaps you, you wouldn't have when you were starting out? You know, I think we still, I mean, we're making progress, but I think there's still, I did a workshop with some young Nigerian um, students uh, a few years ago, they have access, they have much more access to books about realities that are not theirs than they do to books about realities that are theirs. It's just the, you know, it's the truth. And I think it's, it's not just Nigeria, I think it's all across Sub-Saharan Africa. So you have these kids who said it, they're writing the stories and you're sort of, the characters all had strange names. You know? And often it, they lived in a kind of vaguely American or, it was just very strange, many of the stories. And then I would ask them, you know, what's your name, Chinelu? Why is your character's name um, something like, you know, Christabel? And they would say, because it's nicer. <laughs> you know, so, so Chinelu isn't nice. They're sort of quiet. And it just, and you know, because I recognized it, mm. I know what mm. it is. And um, so, you know, I did my, my rant about Chinelu is beautiful. Christabel doesn't have to be. But I think we still have, it's still there. Well, well, thinking about that sort of almost one-way flow of what, what, is, what is culture and what is mm. literature mm. that you're saying still exists, um, I was um, sort of you know, thinking about Achebe's naming you as, as fearless, which is sort of mm. one of my favorite words. And it's an acknowledgment of the, the difficult task of, of telling the story of, of, a, of a conflict that has sort of torn a country apart. But I think the difficulty of telling the story not only to the people who experienced it, but to the rest of us as well. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps it's about that, um, that you know, telling it elsewhere that, that inevitably happens when a book is read mm -hmm. as widely as yours is. And I just wondered, you know, having after the fact been called fearless, did you feel any, any kind of trepidation in, in embarking upon it? <laughs> <laughs> did I think now that I have been labeled fearless? I no, I mean before, I mean before, oh. were you, did you feel any? You know, no, and, and I have to be honest and say I didn't particularly feel fearless. Um, yeah. I didn't. I, and in some ways, I was a lot more concerned about the people who had, in fact, lived in Biafra mm -hmm. and experienced Biafra. I was a lot more concerned about, about telling their stories in a way that I felt gave it dignity and, and was true. And I mean, I, I really didn't think that anybody else would care about half of the other mm. sons. So I, I, I was not at all... Um, consciously um, aware of the idea of, you know, I'm telling the world about Biafra. Really, what I was thinking was <sighs> two things. I was thinking my grandfather's died in the war. If, if somehow dead people can see, what would they think about the book? And then also I was thinking about all the people who fought in Biafra and who lived through Biafra, and, and I was thinking, what would they think when they read it? So, so there was a lot of um, fear, you know, Anxiety and yes. fear, and you know, half of Ellison was so emotionally. It took a lot from me emotionally. I mean, I would read about refugee camps and write a scene in a refugee camp, and suddenly I would stop and think, my grandfather died in a refugee camp. Mm. You know, my grandfather was buried in a mass grave. I, I, I very much felt that, you know, I inherited a sense of loss, mm -hmm. and um, so it wasn't so much the I'm fearless who's going to read this book. It was more just a deeply very personal thing when I was walking in half of Ellison. 
But with this book, I, you know, half of it and I cried. This book, I laughed. <laughs> so yes, I, well, I and it's very good for my <laughs> mental health because, because <laughs> There's a, a wonderful scene in Americana where I think it's Kimberly um, keeps the, the yeah it's Kimberly <coughs> keeps referring to these beautiful people she encounters. So this beautiful security guard, this this beautiful cleaner, and we realise that beautiful is her euphemism for black. That cracked me up. <laughs> I, <was> just, <laughs> I thought it was so funny, and and I laughed a lot in this book. And I don't know why I was surprised, but I kept thinking, oh my goodness, this is all hilarious. And at times I think I was laughing. I was worried it was inappropriate. And so, <laughs> and so I, I did want to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you about the, 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 the humor in the book. And, and, you know, obviously you wielded it with intention. <laughs> you know, I mean, I made the conscious decision. I wanted to write about love and I wanted to write about race. And I wanted to write about hair. Yes. So the things I wanted to write about. And there, there's certain, sometimes unspoken rules of what literary fiction should be and mm. should do. And, um, and in the way that subjects are approached. So I think that the, way to, the generally accepted way to write about race, for example, in the West, is that it has to be, you know, the more meditative, the better. It has to be mm -hmm. sort of lyrical and it has to, um, you know, everybody has to be ambivalent and ambig everything has to be ambiguous. And you can't have characters take very, and if you do have a character take a certain position at the end, you have to complicate it so much that you're not quite sure what the character thinks or feels. And at the end, everybody's watery and fuzzy and nobody knows what, and that's the way, and you know, and I think, and I think because literary fiction has become a form that no longer challenges in a, in a socially conscious way, um, this is the way you're supposed to do it. And, and I knew I could have done that. I know the tropes, right? Mm, I, mm. I could have done that. But I didn't want to because I felt I wanted to write the book about race that I would like to read. And I also just wanted to write a book that felt true. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I, um, so it was a conscious decision to write it the way that, where it's sort of, it's unsubtle, um, very happily unsubtle. Well, I know I'm, I won't be the only reader who was grateful to you for breaking the rules. And I have to say that there were moments um, when we're reading FMLU's blog posts, mm -hmm. which are direct and exhilaratingly confrontational mm -hmm. at times. And I thought, I can't believe she wrote that out loud. You know, <laughs> did you really say that? And whooping with joy, because they're things that we think, mm -hmm. things that we experience, but they're not out there. And mm -hmm. also, I think, as a reader, thinking of your wide readership mm -hmm. and the conversations that would start, you know, mm -hmm. about hair, yeah. about, um, you know, what hair means politically and yeah. in terms of self-image and so on. I wondered if you had experienced a kind of liberation writing mm. this book. Did mm. you? <laughs> kind of, yes. Yeah. But also, I mean, when I, when I was writing it, I, I was, you know, mostly happy when it was going well. And then when I finished and sort of my first readers read it and my editor wasn't very pleased because, you know, my American editor felt that it should be more subtle. And then I, I suddenly I was terrified. And then mm. a friend of mine said to me, you know, people loved you because of half of the yellow, so now you're in trouble. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, okay, <laughs> I need to find a day job. But, um, <laughs> but, but also, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm still very excited that it's actually out and that mm. it's a book. You know, I, I would do it exactly the same way if I had to do mm -hmm. it again. I mm. would, absolutely. When we were speaking earlier about your grandfathers, they, you know, to me, I heard a sense of almost responsibility mm -hmm. in what you were mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. And, you know, thinking about, you know, a theme of, of that connecting cultures, this does it in a very different way, mm -hmm. because I think that all those people who are maybe wanting the same writer to write the same book again and then find themselves mm -hmm. with something entirely new and very contemporary and, and as you say, very in your face at mm -hmm. times, will start a new conversation. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. And I, and I think also a conversation that we should have. I mean, um, somebody said to me yesterday, or two days ago, I forget, because she, she said, um, intelligent journalists have been writing about hair because of your book. And I said, the assumption is intelligent journalists shouldn't be mm -hmm. writing about hair. But I said to her, people write entire novels about baseball. Yes. <laughs> and this somehow is fine. Mm -hmm. And intelligent journalists write about baseball. Mm -hmm. right? So why is black women's hair somehow something that we should find remarkable when it's written about? And when, you know, so I thought these are, I mean, and race, I think, is also um, a conversation that, and you, even, even the idea of a conversation about race, I find very strange. I mean, I think race is something we should acknowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and I, there's such a discomfort around the subject. When you talk about race or write about race in a way that doesn't 
sort of keep everybody else com keep everybody comfortable, which really means it's very watery. You're not really taking a position mm -hmm. or saying anything. When you do that, I think people immediately sort of the way to the way to sort of evade engaging with it is to label the person talking about it angry. Mm -hmm. So you know you have to be an angry black woman if you're saying that. You know, and it's a very I find it very interesting, very interesting. Is that because there's a sense that you, as a black woman, as an African woman? have a responsibility? Because I often worry about that idea mm. of having a responsibility or a role. How do you mm. feel about that? No, I don't, I don't think, you know, mm -mm, I, don't have, I don't have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. I just, I, uh, you know, I really love that young girls walk up to me in Nigeria and they say, I want to be a writer because of you. I love the sense of my people, right? Mm -hmm. I love mm -hmm. that, that it means something to them. But on the other hand, I find myself sometimes resisting that kind of your role model thing because it can get very prescriptive. Um, by people who've said to me, you know, <laughs> this woman wrote me a very lovely email. This woman who's a dentist in Lagos, and she said, Chimama Dao, you know, you, you mean so much to us, my daughter looks up to you, but please, in your next book, don't write about sex. <laughs> oh, dear. And, and it doesn't end there. She goes, and if you must write about sex, please don't make it enjoyable. <laughs> That's like one of the best emails that I saw. <laughs> so apparently, she felt that I wasn't being a good role model to her daughter by writing about, not only writing about sex, but making it enjoyable. <laughs> So that's why I find myself resisting mm -hmm. there. So, but in terms of a responsibility, no, it's not. I don't start off with this worthy idea of, I want to write about what I care about. Mm. And my feeling is that in caring about these things, that there are other people who care about them as I do. Yes. You know, and, that, and that often these people share my kind of my, my biography in a way. You know, that I think there are lots of um, black African women who who are who are concerned about the same things as I am just because we you know that that there are similarities in the way we experience the world mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. I want to ask you a little bit more about how about who you read because there are all kinds mm. of reasons we come as readers to your books but I, I wondered about what gives you fuel who, mm. who do you love reading when I was working this book I was I've started reading a lot more poetry when I write fiction um, and I read I don't read poetry in the same way as fiction I sort of just let poetry wash over me mm -hmm. And um, I fell in love with Derek Walcott when I was um, writing this. I just think he is just, he, I, he's marvelous. Um, so I got all of his books and I would, when it wasn't going well, I'd just sort of lie down and just, just read his poems. I read a lot of um, J.P. Clark, mm -hmm. who's a Nigerian poet. Um, Tanuro Jaide, who's a Nigerian poet. Um, Gabriel Okara, who's a fantastic Nigerian poet. Um, I read a bit of, um, so I would sort of go to the library and get the American poetry collections and just sort of, you know, read them. Mm -hmm. This book, in some ways, is also my way of celebrating Graham Greene, who I actually mm -hmm. really love. The Heart of the Matter is a book I just deeply admire. And um, uh, so in some ways also, I've actually, I, I think this book is also about books and about reading mm -hmm. and the joy yes. of reading. Yes. Um, see, every time I'm asked about who I... I know it's a terrible you know, question, I, I sorry. Forget, <laughs> I forget, I always forget. Chilmanda, you've been so generous with your answers and thank you very, very much. <laughs>